Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest this week is Ed Hussein. Ed Hussein is an author and indeed a advisor uh, to international governments. He is the author of a number of books, uh, quite famously a book that he wrote uh, about 10 years ago, which was called The Islamist, it was about his own experience uh, as a Islamist uh, in the UK and indeed how that came about and how it ended. He then went on to write a book called uh, The World of Islam. His most recent book, which has just come out, and you might have already seen it in the media, is this one, Among the Mosques, A Journey Across Muslim Britain. Um, Ed, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you're now obviously at uh, Georgetown University as an adjunct professor. What, what is an adjunct professor exactly? An adjunct professor comes in from outside and has other responsibilities, isn't committed full time to the university. So I don't teach horrendous hours all around the clock. I, I teach a very specific course on Western civilization. So it's on my terms. But thank you, Peter, for hosting me. I appreciate it. Oh, no, it's, it's a pleasure. Ed, good, to, good to have you. Um, with this book, this is a journey, as you say, across Muslim Britain. Uh, you went, as I understand it, to 10 different cities. Or, or towns, ten different places, uh, to visit specifically mosques. Um, what was your when you started this? When you before you started it, uh, what if you like were you expecting to find, or did you have no pre preconceptions? Yes, uh, my publishers were very keen. Bloomsbury were very keen that I go in with an open mind. And I try to channel Socrates in that Socratic spirit of asking open questions and not appearing with a with a fixed agenda. If there was an agenda, the only agenda was, is there a sense of belonging here? Now, one of the great interviews you've done, Peter, is with the great late Sir Roger Scruton. And Roger was a mentor, a friend and a teacher to me. And Roger's focus was on belonging. And all I wanted to, if, if that was the bias, was the bias was to see is there a coherent sense of belonging, harmony, attachment, love, loyalty to England and its ways, or, or by extension, Scotland and Wales, because I went there too. Um, so that was the only bias. But other than that, it was a genuine open inquiry to see what is going on inside those institutions, i.e. mosques in Britain, that appear closed to most of the population, but are open, obviously, to most Muslims. So it was an attempt to understand what was going on. I think, uh, I mean, you're quite right. We seem to it, go through phases of knowing or being, you know, it being reported upon what is happening in mosques. We, you know, it seems to kind of go in waves, then it seems to go into the background. Um, but one point you do make is that mosques now, or at least uh, from the book, are mostly enthralled to the Diobandi uh, strain. Um, I wonder whether you could explain what that means, actually. Yes, Peter, well highlighted. And that's part of our problem in Britain at the moment, in that we have uh, a denomination which, on the one hand, produced a Taliban in Afghanistan. On the other hand, was set up, was established in the 18, late 1850s, early 1860s to oppose the British presence in India. And now finds itself in Britain with those you know, heavy uh, burdens from history, being anti-British and yet in Britain, now controlling just over 40% of mosques in, in the UK and unable often to condemn the Taliban or re even engage in the civil society political process. So that's the, the, the dark side and the horrendous literalism, the very, very morbid uh, orthodox, extreme form of approaching scripture, devoid of reason, devoid of uh, understanding modernity and context, but harping back to an imagined golden age in the seventh century. Now, that's the Del Bundy tradition in Britain, as it is in Pakistan, where blasphemy laws are a real problem, thanks to 
the, the, the increased presence of the Deobandis. And th it's the same movement that produced the Taliban that is now, as British and American troops withdraw, is reassert reasserting this control. But there is a good story here. And the good story is in India, the same movement is supportive of a secular government. The same movement is supportive of a nation state. But our authorities and our Muslim communities and the so-called leaders haven't invested in better understanding that dichotomy and saying to Muslims in India and Muslims who have come from India, welcome to Britain. We need you to be the patriotic, pro-secular state type of Deobandis we have in India. And you should not be afraid of flying the Union Jack outside mosques as they are flown outside mosques in India. And by the way, here in Britain, Women and men are welcome in mosques as they are in large parts of India, including the mosques in Delhi that I've visited. So there's a real disconnect that we are fostering, harboring and allowing to grow the, the, the more ugly, monstrous, uh, anti-Western, anti-British form of Deobandism uh, across the country. Would you say, therefore, that, you know, after from when you went out on this uh, this uh, trip with an open mind, would you say that you are more worried, therefore, about the future or less? Um, or should I say more optimistic, more pessimistic? I I'm more worried. I'm more worried uh, for several reasons. Firstly, I did not anticipate to see uh, literature in mosques, especially in the mosque in Manchester that had produced the terrorist that blew himself up in the Ariana Grande concert. And to see that mosque still being a home for the kind of extremist literature that produced the terrorist, to see that mosque having uh, funeral prayers for a for the for the for the, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood had died in Egypt. He's not even here, but there was a funeral prayer in absentia held for him. And to see at that mosque a Sharia court, which means in effect, you know, something that I think, I mean, it is abhorrent to modern Britain that you can't accept the common law tradition. You've got to have a separate legal system which grows over time. Um, I mean, that's just one example in Manchester. There were many, and you know, I've I've never felt any. I've been fortunate and blessed in my life. I've never felt any bout of depression. It's never been an issue. And it was during the, the, the long sessions of writing this book, traveling between mosques, staying in northern towns, that I first saw what Winston Churchill would call that black dog, you know, real depression about, about the future. But at the same time, I'm conscious that, um, you know, Roger would always encourage us to be optimistic that, mm -hmm. You know, small C conservatives who wish to conserve and preserve and protect our heritage and pass it on to a new generation cannot afford to be no. uh, pessimistic. So we've got to be optimistic and fix this problem because it is imminently fixable. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is to awaken the nation to what is going on. So uh, you know, collectively, those of us who are engaged in this space can, as, as we come out of the European Union and Brexit reasserts a sense of national sovereignty, we start to focus on who we are uh, as one people in one country. Yes. <clears throat> one people in one country uh, is, is quite interesting um, because I think there's a quote actually in, in the book, uh, Ed. Um, I've got it here. Multiculturalism has now enabled monoculturalism. Um, I would understand that to be that multiculturalism, the doctrine, um, emphasise separate separation. And so, therefore, you do have places now in Britain where, even though on the surface it is a multicultural city, in fact, it's a, a whole load of very monocultural enclaves. Would that be right to say? Yes, sadly. I, I wish I could disagree with you, Peter, and say, no, you're wrong. I really wish I could, but you're right, because that's where we are in large parts of Blackburn, Manchester, Birmingham, Keithley, Rochdale, indeed, parts of East London. Those are places that I visited and I'd, and I'd seen. And, and a couple of times I went there with my, you know, white female, and I hate using those kind of division lines, but just for the benefit of your viewers and listeners, you know, white female uh, researcher with me uh, who felt completely out of place in, in, in parts of Birmingham. Now, she felt out of place, not because she's in any way negative. It's just she stood out. She was the only person there who was of a different, often a different gender, but most often, 
uh, of a different skin tone and therefore it was a real real issue now I, I am a product of multiculturalism and I I, I, I thought you know for, for many years it was uh, it was a good thing but then the more I studied the consequences of it the more I realized that in the name of multiculturalism we've, we've lost the multi bit and it's just mono in large parts of Britain and that therein lies the problem that where is the mixing where is the harmony where is the you know the, the, the tapestry of of, of people of different backgrounds, working, living, uh, indeed marrying, reproducing, and recreating a great nation. That is missing. And my, my other objection of late, I think, to multiculturalism is that it assumes all cultures are the same. It's not just that it celebrates the difference and amplifies the, the ghettoization and thinks that's a good thing. It also assumes that all cultures are the same. And I'm afraid all cultures are not the same that uh, uh, and it's not a dig at a religion it's just a point that any culture that wants to keep women subservient and the second class citizens is not the same as a culture that sees women as equals a culture that wants to treat jewish people or others as second class uh, people is not the same as a western culture that wants to give everybody uh, equal status in the eyes of the rule of law and i could go on to prove that we should not assume that all cultures are the same and therefore uh, try to incorporate you know, homophobia, uh, anti-gender uh, equality, anti, I mean, they're, they're, I, mean I, I, I don't want to overdo it, but that, that's that's the basic premise that there, we should not assume that we're all culturally the same. You know, um, the British empire famously in India is blamed for all kinds of problems, Peter. But when the Brits rocked up in India, they saw a Hindu practice of something called surti mm. where you would um the the, the 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 widow of a recently deceased husband would be thrown into the funeral pyre in india mm. because she was the possession of her husband and her husband is no longer there and these possessions were being burnt and she was burnt uh with him or with with his corpse the british stopped that because it was fundamentally inhumane in these unjust wrong because of the Christian teaching that all souls are equal and all souls have their own place in the eyes of God. Now, is that culture, the Hindu culture that was practiced then in India, the same as a culture that liberates and honors women? No, it isn't. And I think we've got to be, we've got to mm -hmm. continue, continue to work in that spirit that not all cultures are the same. One of the points actually, I th which is, is very striking, you say that you had more of a, of a multicultural approach before, but that that is, change. You say that one way of maybe being hopeful about the future is that we have to be very confident about our traditions and values. Um, now, this is, uh, this is not actually to uh, uh, denigrate the, your, your, what you're saying in your book. This is something one is hearing a lot um, and that somehow it is actually to repair the damage done maybe by multi multiculturalism. Isn't that one of the problems though with that Ed, is that we have got the most appalling collapse of confidence in those things. I mean, I would agree with you totally, that is what we need. But even if you look at America, which once did have that, this overarching sense of what America was, that seems to be going now down what we might call the European route. That is disappearing fast. I mean, this is a problem, isn't it? It is a problem, yes. It is a problem as it looks at this moment now. You know, America's mm. come out of this, you know, a very difficult moment. I mean, too many young people and those elsewhere in the. I mean, look at look at America and think that President Biden is a communist and President Trump was a Nazi. You know, mm. There's an extreme viewing of politics. Mm. And I think that what we see in the natural order of things throughout history is there's a balancing out that as this administration sees its way out, we hope that the Republican Party regains a much more centrist, center-right approach to its political spaces and able to win back large numbers of people who it lost. And, and conversely, the Democrats are able to return away from the so-called progressives, you know, the AOCs, the Ilhan Omars, Rashida Tlaibs, and others who are doing huge amounts of damage to the to the American imagination. The good news, however, is this, 
that when I'm with my students, I, you know, in, in class, I don't, and this is a, you know, a, a very liberal college and it's a very liberal city here in Washington, DC. I do detect a very strong sense of attachment to land, i.e. America, a very strong sense of defending the inheritance of the, of the English uh, common law systems, the jury trials, and a very, very strong sense of patriotism and understanding that America has a responsibility to uphold uh, the, the notions of equality on all spheres throughout the world. But the, the danger is that the, the mood music played by the far left can often eat away at American confidence. But I, I put it to you at, the, at, the, at the, the, the risk of sounding controversial, a lot of insulation work has been done, I think, on campuses and, uh, and elsewhere in the last two years by people like Jordan Peterson and indeed Sir Roger Scruton, that, that they've mapped out what it is to be both modern and mm -hmm. preserve the West for future generations, mm -hmm. which gives me great hope that had it not been for these two figures in particular, what Roger has done, and indeed what Jordan Peterson has done for this generation, what Alan Bloom had done for a previous generation, Leo Strauss for a generation before that, and you know, Disraeli and others for a generation before that. Every generation we have these new thinkers. And I think that the last point I'd make is this, that we, uh, you know, across the West, and I say this as someone who's fully cognizant of the fact that it was the great Romans in the year 212 that gave us this idea of millions of people becoming Roman citizens if they accepted Roman values of SPQI, you know, the Senate and the people of Rome. Similarly, today, we, we've, you know, it's been an ongoing conversation for almost 2000 years about the imminent decline of the West. And I think it's because we are concerned, because there are people like you and others fighting in the public domain to keep this heritage in this culture, we always win. Mm -hmm. Over time, we always win. There's a reason why we're not speaking German today. There's a reason why we're not speaking Turkish in the 1680s, the, the Turks lost. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I think we will win, we will prevail, but we've got to keep this concern and this, this, this sense of, you know, where are we headed? What do we need to insulate you know, a younger generation from the corruption of, of, of corrosive thought? There's one, one point though, I think I, I, I wanted to address really, Ed, is that you, you say in the book, in fact, one of the first points you make in the book is that the Muslim population of Britain is, is growing hugely, you know, compared to any other minority. Um, isn't there the point to be made that if that is the case, and indeed in terms of immigration too, um, that actually there's no, there's no need to integrate? I mean, that, you know, if, if things are at that stage, then you have almost ready-made communities, you, you don't need to integrate. Is, isn't the whole point about integration of any population that somehow if it's it's got to be reasonable in terms of reasonable numbers in order for people to actually integrate but they just don't yes. have to at the moment yes you you've, you've put your finger on the pulse of the problem that you know, in large parts of the country that that integration is not happening and why should it you know why should muslims in Dewsbury give up the comfort of you know, one language you know one community and you know, the, the separatism that you allude to and then work harder to get to the rest of the country i think that, that we are now at about 25 to 30 political constituencies that are in that zone you know and before it gets worse you know we've got to change that attitude we've got to put our minds to it we've got to end the ghettos the better jobs the better lifestyles the the, the better families the better future has got to be outside the ghettos. You know, there's, there's got to be, whether you call it a brain drain or whether you call it anything else, there's got to be much more movement of the population. And that, it can't be left alone as it is, because if it is, then you're right. By the year 2080, 2090, we will have you know, 40 or so areas where there will be majority separatists who will have separatist demands legally, who will have separatist cultures, who will have separatist political enclaves. And that that has, has real consequences of a different kind of Britain. Um, and I think I mean, that's what we're doing. We're sounding the alarm unless unless we wake up to that. Uh, you know, here in, in America, what, despite the many challenges, what you do see when you walk around its large cities is, you know, Asian people married to white people, married to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to black people, married to Asians. And there's a real mixing. And you see that in parts of London. But I think you know, that's where the great hope lies, that more Muslim women and men stop marrying their cousins from Pakistan, stop mm -hmm. creating all the problems that has on the health system 
uh, you know, with the with the result on kind of disabled children and whatnot, and just marry in Britain with the rest of the population. And you know, we we can talk about this till the cows come home. But the real issue is there's got to be political leadership on this, which goes back to your previous point about confidence. There needs to be a confident centre in in government that articulates a vision. And finally, if after the vision being articulated, if after the terrorism being you know uh, seem to be out of control. If after all of the invitations to come on and to belong to mainstream Britain, there is a reluctance, then we've got to be in a position to say, if you don't like it here, if this country is so abhorrent, then please leave. And that's something that has to manifest as part of our confidence, that if you're in Britain, these are seven, eight values that this country has inherited you know, from reason, individualism, gender equality, its openness, its uniqueness, its racial equality, and so on, that undercuts the extremism of the of the religious fanatic and if you if you don't want to sign up to those values sorry this is not a country that's that's for you you, you know you've got to go whether it's to afghanistan or pakistan sudan or wherever else you think you can live that lifestyle and so we haven't said that yet and i think at some point that's something that needs to be on the cards do you think that before one got to that point say um do you would you say that for example there could be conditions in which there becomes a specifically muslim political party uh, uh, yeah, it was attempted already, by the way, in the 1980s and the 1990s, something called the Muslim Parliament of Britain was started and it was a complete failure, thankfully. <laughs> you know, it was an utter failure because, you know, people realised it was a separate institution. It was connected to Iran. So there was already all of that attempted and failed. But maybe a new generation will not remember that and will will try. And by the way, there is already an attempt at the Muslim political party by George Galloway. I mean, he mm. keeps going up in, in these so-called Muslim areas, Tower Hamlets, Bradford, and recently in Batley and failing. So, so far that attempt is failing, but you're, 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 we, we shouldn't disregard that attempt. And I think, you know, given Britain's political system, it will also fail, mm. but it will, it will try uh, to raise its ugly head. And it will try to raise its ugly head, ugly head on that leftist Islamist nexus. Mm. Um, and you kind of... mentioned Tower Hamlets there. I mean, you were born and bred in the East End of London, weren't you? Yes. And um, you did you go to you went to school in, in Tower Hamlets? Am I right in saying? Or yes, uh, William Burroughs Primary School. Yes. Yeah. Um, you obviously wrote about this in your book, The Islamist, which I think was two thousand and seven. I was wrong before. I think two thousand and seven. Uh, and that was a that had a lot of coverage. That book, didn't it? Um, yes. I mean, it, you know, because a lot of people watching won't necessarily know your story, but I mean, you became involved partic specifically in Hizbut Tahir, didn't you? The, the Islamist group. What, you know, what actually got you involved? I mean, I know that you probably, you've told this story many times, I'm sure, but what broadly got you involved? I mean, you, you, you didn't come from a particularly strict religious household, did you? Or? No, it's a very mystical, love-oriented, you know, the, the, the religion of beauty, mm. uh, of, of of art, of civilization, of attachment to God. That Islam, that's the the, the beautiful Islam that my parents had grew, grown up in. Uh, but a couple of things happened, Peter. One, the, the Bosnia crisis, where white, blonde, blue-eyed Muslims were being killed in their thousands by you know, Serbs, Croats, and others. But the the, the issue was. You know, if that was the situation in Bosnia, uh, you know, 50, 60 years after the Holocaust, then what would it be here in Britain? And and that sense of identity angst, uh, conflict of not knowing whether we belonged or not, was exploited by a, a range of Islamist organizations from the Muslim Brotherhood to others. And, you know, I fell for their propaganda for, for, for several years as a 15, 16 year old. And, you know, I, I'm not blaming anybody other than to say what was missing was an articulation of of, of a stronger identity in Britain mm. and an explanation as to why we are not, we were not getting involved in Bosnia. The only focus for me at that point was being Muslim. And that was part of the problem. When you make religious identity your only identity, you almost always end up in the extremes. So I was attracted to Hezbollah Tahrir and others for a period of time because they gave you know a global network, a very strong identity and a, and, and a sense of belonging. I eventually saw through that, but I maintain that we, you know, unless we on in the rest of the country can also offer, you know, a stronger, deeper identity, which we can, 
and a, and a much rooted sense of belonging, which we can, then we let, leave the void for the extremists. And I was only able to exit from the extremism when I suddenly realized that I was more than just Muslim. And I refused to be boxed into this victim category of being Muslim. Uh, and it's just by escaping that, that, that you escape extremism. When people leave things like that or when they change, uh, it's not generally a gradual thing, is it? Was there something that happened that that actually made you think, ah, you know what, this is wrong? Yes, yes, there was. There was a very specific moment. But you're right, there, the norm never really is a moment. There are several moments. But but of those moments, one strikes out again and again. And that was, you know, we were calling for jihad in Bosnia in my organization. We were calling for violence in Egypt, in Kashmir, in China. There was always this China. It's not just a modern issue in China, but, but it was ongoing in Nigeria, in Sudan. We were always calling for jihad in various parts of the world in order to end what we saw as oppression of Muslims. It never occurred to us that these were not ordinary Muslims. They were extremists looking for political power. But the point is that rhetoric of violence elsewhere once that genie is out of the bottle, it never waits for violence elsewhere at a particular time. I saw on my college campus in Newham College, a young uh, African Christian man who was stabbed to death by uh, another man identifying, identifying himself as Muslim. And I, and I saw the, 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 the individual who was deceased, you know, on, on the floor bleeding. And, and you know, the connection between ideas and reality just hit that you can't just call for violence and separatism as an ideal mm. it is reality and it was that moment that i walked away and i thought these people were terrible news just not just for my local community but for also for the future of the country and the world mm. and this was before isis this was before 9 11 by by two years so it was mm. just the early awakening that this is where you know, the mood music of extremism always, always leads to terrorism. Yeah. Um, Ed, I wonder if you could comment on something. I mean, you, you, here we are, we're, we're talking about the need not to have enclaves, the need not to have separate communities, um, and also the need for us to be confident of our values. Um, obviously, you'd know about the situation that there's been recently, in fact, is ongoing in Batley in Yorkshire. Um, to me, this is a kind of quite a good microcosm of what we're talking about in a way. Uh, teacher shows cartoons uh, to his pupils. Uh, the school basically almost disown him. There's a big demonstration outside. The guy goes into hiding. Now, um, that obviously is the sort of thing that would exercise people like me a lot, you know, in terms of free speech. What do you think should have happened in that situation if we are going to have um a good future and and not not a not a problematic future well I, I saw this um again and again when i was writing the book i asked this very question what is the pronouncement for someone who either draws a cartoon shows a cartoon or even supports the right for muslims to be offended because of a derogatory portrayal of the prophet muhammad and there were several imams in private who were very very uh, concerned about where this whole direction of travel was headed but the vast majority of the individuals i spoke to about this in public and in private were supportive of the position that's advocated in pakistan which is if anyone blasphemes against the prophet muhammad you kill them and you know I met an individual in Glasgow uh, who was of that position and, and elsewhere. Now, the, the way it should have been handled by Muslims and others is to realize that it's, you know, it's not to your taste. It may offend you, but it's bad art. Get over it. You, know? you don't then go and have physical consequences for someone who decides to show bad art. Now, is it aesthetically appealing? No. Does it do anything for your religious awareness or appreciation of beauty? No, but it is a, a fundamental freedom of speech and expression on which the modern West and the modern world is based. You destroy that, you destroy who we are. You remove that, you eventually it comes to no rights for Muslims too. Muslims are only in the West in those large numbers because of that bridge of freedom. Don't burn that bridge because that bridge can also be burnt both ways. And there's a, we're playing with fire here 
And I don't think many Muslims have fully appreciated how risky and how dangerous this is. And that's why I'm a big su supporter of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the president of France on this, because he's, he's gripped it and he's confronted it. And he said, you know, this is a red line that the French Republic will not allow to be crossed. And I think we need to have a similar amount of confidence in our government to be able to take this fight head on. It is the fight of the future. It's a question of time when it raises its head again and again. And, I, you know, we've got some of the greatest people in government to be able to address this, whether it's Boris Johnson, Yira Mirza, Priti Patel, Sajid Javed. The list is long. I mean, it's interesting that the Conservatives have more of a diversity in their cabinet without talking about multiculturalism than others that do talk about it but can't can't actually produce it. But but that's why I think it's, it's vital for this government and this party, Wyland government, to address this issue with confidence. <clears throat> but I, I think you mentioned Macron there. Um, fact is, yes, um, they, uh, the parties, Labour and uh, Tory party, were conspicuous by their silence on this particular issue. They just simply vacated the field. And at least the French... Uh, you know, Macron and the French have always talked about cultural issues, I would I would suggest. Um, but I think that this is this is in a way, is it not a microcosm? This is these things are little little crunch moments, are they not? Yes, they are. It's a drip drip effect mm -hmm. and it continues to grow. And, you know, we, we've but by the way, Peter, this is not new. This happened with Salman Rushdie. Oh, I know. And then it happened with the Danish cartoons. And then it's happened two or three other times at a much lower level, and now it's happening again. And the truth is, it's, I, mean, I, I have friends who are playwrights that can't get their plays on these because they're somehow critical of Islam, never mind the Prophet Muhammad. And the truth is the Prophet, when he called to mercy, he called to kindness that someone urinated in his mosque, he didn't care. Like, get beyond it. I mean, Islam's mm -hmm. got to be bigger than this and more confident than that. Mm -hmm. If you can't take criticism that you're in the wrong religion, you know, Islam. And by the way, Muslims aren't victims. For for a, a thousand four hundred years, Muslims were conquerors. Mm. You know, so stop this kind of fake pretense of that. Uh, oh, oh, you know, we're so offended by just a simple cartoon. No, let mm. people have a hundred cartoons. Who cares? You know, we're bigger than that. We're stronger than that. We're deeper than that, and we can take the criticism. Mm. Um, and you know, the, the bigger issue here is that no cartoon should lead to a loss of life, and no cartoon should lead to the loss of freedom. And that's the risk that the, 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 the Muslims being or extremist Muslims at the helm of identity are being so intolerant that they are damaging the cultural space in which we all operate and, and enjoy the freedoms that we do. Yes, I would, I would, I would agree with that. I think the other point really to make there is that people often, the, the cartoon thing has been at the forefront. Um, and so people say, why? Why do you? Why are you so obviously being provocative? But as you mentioned, there, Salman Rushdie, it, it's not really even a matter of aesthetic standards. It's you know, it's whether it's a very literary novel or, as you mentioned, a play or a film. You know that people now will self censor. Um, Ed, look, thank you very, very much uh, for for joining us. I know you've got to go off to do a, one of your lectures, I believe, or something, um, in the huge heat there of uh, Washington. Um, <laughs> But the book, again, is Among the Mosques, A Journey Across Muslim Britain. And um, the author is Ed Hussein. Um, Ed, thank you very, very much. Um, I do hope, when are you coming, when are you going to be back in Britain next? I, I'm, I'm back for a short period at the end of August and the very beginning of September. So we hope our paths cross, Peter. Well, uh, I think if, if, if that's right, if I'm thinking right, that's about the time we... We was we were just about be, to be going into into the next lockdown at that point, and so <laughs> <laughs> so our path may not cross. No. We may not cross. Well, thank you very very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. God um, bless. Thank you. Bye bye. That's it for uh, so what you're saying is this week. Uh, please do remember to subscribe, won't you? And uh, we shall see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.